All right, so what I'd like to do today is just kind of pick up where I left off uh, yesterday, because uh, to you know talk a little bit more about this conjecture, in particular what the evidence we have is. And like I said, there's kind of a bunch of examples, and there's kind of one kind of really general piece of evidence in favor of this conjecture. So what, let's just remind uh, ourselves. of where I kind of left things yesterday. So we started off in Calabia threefold. And then I took some specific moduli space. I took a moduli of a one dimensional sheaves with some stability condition. And the, the idea is that the support of the sheath is this class beta that I singled out. So beta is some element of H2. And I want to kind of try to do some kind of like curve counting theory in this class beta. And then I fix I equals one. And then there was some stability condition, which I, I won't go into again. And the point is that this has a map for this chow variety, which just parameterizes one cycles, not schemes, just curves with multiplicities. And then I kind of, you know, made this definition, which was I basically I have this kind of DT sheaf upstairs that we kind of constructed on Tuesday. I push it forward and then I take its perverse cohomology sheaves. And the claim is that the Euler characteristic of these perverse cohomology sheaves, if I kind of repackage as a, a linear combination of the cohomology of tori, This is the definition of my uh, of these kind of integer invariants. And then the conjecture with Toda is that you know this is in some sense kind of recovering what you get from these other approaches to curve counting. For instance, the one that I've been using in these in these lecture courses is approach via um, stable pairs invariants. Okay. And then, I mean, actually, I made a mistake. So when I spoke about this yesterday, I kind of assumed Rahul had already started talking about the relationship with gromov witten theory. But I, 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 I think maybe he did it today and not yesterday. But then the idea is that this also these th these theories also equivalent to the gromov witten theory should be equivalent to the gromov witten theory of the threefold. And so these numbers, if you believe everything I'm saying, would kind of control the gromov witten theory too. Um, and so, I mean, so when, when I say it determines that, you know, there was some kind of explicit formula where you have to kind of basically take the log of this kind of generating function. And I didn't say this explicitly last time, but, you know, the reason this log is there is that um, the stable pairs theory, the support of the sheets doesn't have to be connected. You can have kind of disconnected support and that that's no problem. Uh, stability on the other hand in the sheaf theory will basically will force the support of this sheaf to be connected. So going from connected to disconnected, you expect some kind of logarithm to show up anyways. Um, one question that I kind of haven't discussed yet and I really I, I will save for tomorrow is, you know, what's special about taking chi equals one there in my definition on a moduli space, why not some other value of chi? Um, and in fact, it, it, it shouldn't matter, actually. We, we expect actually anything. I'll discuss this tomorrow, but basically it shouldn't matter. But the fact that it doesn't matter is kind of a non-obvious constraint. And then, you know, that's kind of something that, you know, you can kind of explore separately. So what, I, what I'd like to talk about today is to kind of just talk about the evidence for this conjecture. So in, in general, I, and I said this last time, you know, we, I, I really think of this conjecture as kind of, you know, some kind of incomplete onsets for trying to understand these numbers in the sense that, you know, there are cases where we can kind of study this very well and, you know, then we have kind of good evidence, but for kind of more complicated geometries, it's still hard to get our hands around. So it's not clear to me that this is going to be the kind of final state of affairs. Um, in particular, this question about whether these numbers 
as I've defined them, are, def is, are deformation invariant is not at all clear to me. And that's obviously a prerequisite because these stable pairs numbers or the Gromov Witt numbers are deformation invariant. But let me give one example. So this is an example that you can open I like a lot, which kind of illustrates um, you know, some, of the, some of the subtleties in this definition kind of show up already. And so, so before I kind of talk about more general evidence, I want to do this one kind of example, at least just state what the numbers are in this case. So this is what's called the Enriquez Calabia. This is a this is a nice geometry that, you know, you know, back in the day, Rahul and I spent some time um, playing around with the invariance of this geometry from the Gromov Witten perspective. And so um, the starting point here is going to be uh, an Enriquez surface S, which is a surface that you get by taking a, a K3 and acting quotienting out by a, a fixed point free involution. You can find K3 surfaces that have such involutions. And then the quotient you get is an Enriquez surface. And then the corresponding Calabiat threefold that I want to take is the following. I'm going to take, E is going to be an elliptic curve. I'm going to take my K3, the pre-quotient, S tilde cross E. And I'm going to mod out by an involution that acts by the fixed point free involution on S tilde and acts by, you know, plus or minus, you know, X by sending, you know, X to negative X on the elliptic curve. And this is, so this is a Calabiat threefold. This is a nice example. And the way you can think about it is that if I uh, take X and I just kind of project onto the E factor, I get a map. E modulo plus or minus one, which is just P1. And so this generically has fibers that are this K3 surface S tilde, but then it also has four, you know, double S fibers. So this is a K3 fibration, but the singular fibers are kind of non-reduced Now, S itself, the Enrique surface, just some, here's just some, some facts about Enrique surface. Enrique surfaces themselves are fibered over P, P1. And these are elliptically fibered. And S itself, when I think of it as an elliptic fibration, also has some doubled fibers. So it has, you know. Where C is, you know. Again, a, a genus one curve. And so what I'd like to do is I'd like to take the example where I take my curve class is just one of these, you know, half fibers. I take this curve class in my um, Enrique surface and then I push it forward into X. So you can think of this as the class C zero. It's gonna come from taking um, C and the Enriquez and then kind of <laughs> projects to zero on this projection down to P1. And so there are some cases that you can look at. Oh, whoops. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Um, all right, so far everything I've said is correct. So the first case we can look at, so then we want to figure out what are, you know, what are these invariants in this setting? These variants as defined in this crazy way. Um, so the, the first case is when I take S to be a generic Enriquez. Enriquez surfaces come in module, come in families. And the behavior of this structure that I'm talking about changes depending on which one I take. So the first case is when S is generic, this double fiber, if I look at the underlying reduced fiber, is smooth. In that case, uh, the corresponding moduli space, um, if I look at first the Chow variety, there are only four um, points in the Chow variety. So in this case, the Chow variety in this class beta is just four points. Corresponding to these four doubled S fibers. 
So we just get shower variety looks like this. Each of these points corresponds to one of these, you know, smooth genus one curves in the corresponding Enriquez fiber. And if I look at the moduli of one dimensional sheaths, I just get a copy of that genus one curve in the moduli space. So we're kind of in this kind of ideal situation. And so this case is really easy to do the calculation for. Uh, if you kind of spit it out, you get that ng beta is you know, four if genus is one, and then zero otherwise. And in particular, this matches with the calculation that you get if you do the kind of Grimm of Witten or PT calculation. But if S is not generic, uh, then the behavior becomes more complicated. So for instance, the simplest case is if this curve, right? So this curve C again is this genus one curve, which is, you know, with multiple C2 is, you know, one of these doubled fibers of my elliptic vibration. And so in general with this, you know, uh, in the non-generic case, this C is still a genus one curve, but it can be nodal or in general, it can be, you know, some kind of, cycle of rational curves that looks like this. There are different types that you get depending on which Enriquez you pick. And so let me pick this one. This is what's called the I2 Enriquez. And so in that case, the Chow variety is no longer uh, just four points anymore. The way to think about it is that this Calabi out threefold well, it, it, before I kind of admits a projection onto P1, but it also admits a projection onto my Enriquez. And well, okay, this, the way to think about it is that, you know, this, whatever this, this vibration is, when I restrict it to one of these two components, it becomes trivial. And so each of the components of this um, copy of C inside of X can kind of move in families and they may or may not kind of, you know, link up again. So the Chow variety, it turns out, ends up being a copy of uh, E cross E. And then what is the moduli space? So the, the, the way to think about this E cross E is that uh, each of these P1s can kind of move and a family parameterized by E, and they can move independently. And so inside of uh, E cross E, well, first of all, uh, you could ask, um, yeah, so first of all, which of these uh, cycles inside of the Chow variety uh, are actually connected? Because the support of my sheaf will have to be connected. And it turns out what it looks like is it looks like, um, so I'm gonna just do this case where C is, I'm just doing this case where C is uh, two theoretical components. It looks like uh, the diagonal, you know, the locus of points, you know, X comma X, and the kind of anti-diagonal where kind of, you know, inside of E cross E. And so these intersect at four points. And then M beta on top of it. So what the, what, what the one cycle looks like at these intersection points, the one cycle is a copy of C. And so these are correspond to those four doubled Enriquez fibers. If I'm at some other point here, that corresponds to um, a partial normalization of C where I kind of separate out one or the other node. And so if I look at the moduli space of one dimensional sheaves with those possible supports, um, I get something that looks like this. Let me try, to, I'll draw the picture. This is what the moduli space looks like. So there are two copies of E. And then over each of these four points, I have this configuration here. Oops. 
And the singularity at each of these kind of singular points here looks like three axes in you know three space meeting. So this looks like the critical locus of X, Y, Z. Everywhere else it's smooth. And then if I did one of these more complicated uh, configurations, so you know another kind of non-generic Enriquez, I would get kind of a similar picture, except it would be like e to the n. You can kind of draw it; it would be kind of more complicated. But you can still do the calculation. I'll explain kind of today how to do kind of do some of these kinds of calculations. You can do this calculation. And what's interesting is that so the Chow variety has kind of changed. It's jumped in dimension from zero dimensional to two dimensional in this case. And the behavior of the image and the behavior of the moduli space has also kind of changed a lot. Uh, but when you do the calculation, you in fact do get uh, the same answer as in the generic case. You still get that n g beta is equal to four, g is equal to one, and zero if g is not equal to one. And so we do have some evidence that even kind of really crazy, you know, relatively kind of you know, uncontrolled uh, deformations, we still have some kind of uh, invariance of the, the calculation. But it's, it's, it's not something that we have any kind of systematic understanding of. Okay. Um, so let me just say one more thing, which will be relevant for what I want to talk about today. So the way I formulated the conjecture was kind of global on the moduli space. I took the invariant, I took the moduli space and I just produced some numbers. But because everything is defined using constructible sheaves or constructible functions, you can kind of do a local version. Instead of working with the entire moduli space, I can fix a point. I could fix a one cycle on X, take the corresponding point on the Chow variety, and then just take the contributions Of this one cycle gamma to both this kind of you know Goku Kumar Vafa invariance as I've defined them, and to this kind of and to the stable pair invariance. So, for instance, the way you do that on the on the kind of Goku Kumar Vafa side is instead of taking the Euler characteristic of this perverse cohomology sheaf, I could just take this perverse cohomology sheaf and then restrict it to the point that I'm interested in on the Chow variety, and then do everything that I was doing before. This is this kind of local invariant. Similarly, on the kind of stable pair side, if I wanted to define, you know, I could just take my pairs moduli space, which again also maps to the Chow variety, and I could just take the, um, you know, the preimage of this point, the fiber of this point that I'm interested in the Chow variety, and then just integrate the Baron function over that. And so then again, you can kind of you know ask for some version. A local version now of this relationship between these two kinds of sets of invariants. Before I had this exponential, what that would correspond to in this case is that you know if I'm interested in the pairs invariant for a given gamma, I should look at not just gamma but also all the kind of effective subcycles of gamma. But the cleanest version happens if gamma happens to be irreducible. So some irreducible curve with multiples d1. And then I just get something that looks like um, Something that looks a lot like my original McDonald formula in the smooth case.
And so really, it's really this local one that's kind of, you know, this local one implies the global one, and I just have to kind of integrate over the Chow variety. And this local one, then you can kind of try to understand cycle by cycle. Okay. So what is the evidence <laughs> for this conjecture? So I, what I'll do is today is I'll kind of focus just on the case when gamma is an irreducible cycle. And then tomorrow I'll talk about the evidence, which is not as strong for kind of more complicated cycles, you know, reducible, non-reduced and so on. And so the main one I want to talk about, which is the kind of, you know, the main general theorem we have so far is in the case of a local surface. So let's say S is some, you know, smooth projective surface. And for kind of te annoying technical reasons, we kind of impose this basically a simple connectedness condition. And then the Kolobiyev threefold that I'm going to take is just the total space of the canonical bundle. So some non-compact Kolobiyev threefold, which has a projection to S. And so then the theorem is that suppose we have a one cycle on X. such that the projection to S is uh, irreducible. Then the relationship between this kind of Gopal-Kumarov-Alpha invariant as we've defined it and the stable pairs invariant that holds for this cycle. So what is the picture here? The picture here is, okay, so here's my surface S and then I put it in, you know, think of it as the base of this non-complex Kolobiyev threefold by taking the total space of a line bundle on it. And then the cycle I have kind of lives up here. So, you know, maybe, it, okay. And the assumption is that the projection to down to S, uh, which, oh, okay, I don't know. <laughs> You know, I projected down to S and I need to get an integral curve when I project it down. So, so this is a stronger hypothesis than just saying that gamma is irreducible. It all, I also need its projection down to S not to have any kind of, you know, not to be, you know, po have positive degree onto its image. On the other hand, um, the singularities, so this is gamma and downstairs is pi lower star of gamma. The singularities of gamma can be quite nasty. So for instance, this projection is a curve inside of a surface. So pi lower star of gamma is a locally planar singularities. In particular, it's Gorenstein, LCI, blah, blah, blah. But gamma itself, uh, be quite nasty. And in fact, I mean, what I think is true is that pretty much, you know, any, you know, any kind of space curve singularity, so embedding dimension three, say some kind of formal singularity type like that, uh, can be approximated arbitrarily well by, um, another formal curve singularity that appears in this theorem. And so in particular, you're going to be able to get, you know, non gorenstein examples, non LCI examples and so on. So really this, I mean, this gives some kind of evidence for a kind of extremely nasty singularity, some version of this theorem being true. And so again, you know, because the cycle is irreducible, when I say the Gromov Witten, uh, sorry, the Gobu Kumar uh, stable pairs conjecture, it's really in the in irreducible case. So, so because we're in the irreducible case, this formulation of this conjecture is kind of simpler to write down. So let me just write it again, if we're summing, A 
I'm integrating my Baron function over the locus of stable pairs that kind of have support gamma. And I'm saying it's basically equal to you know, the Euler characteristic of this kind of stocks of these perverse cohomology sheaves. Up to some normalization. So this, this I interpret as again, this kind of version for very singular curves of, of this McDonald's formula. And I mean, the thing I'll point out is that the, the fiber that uh, over of the, the fiber over this point in this moduli space and beta is um, it's some analog of like the compactified Jacobian of this singular curve. So this is really, you know, taking rank one torsion free sheaves at least set theoretically, it's the same as taking rank one torsion free sheaves on this reduced curve gamma. But because the singularity is just so bad, so bad because we're in the non Gornstein setting, uh, this, we don't really have any control over this kind of space. So, for instance, there are examples, uh, very simple examples, where you can get the space to be a reducible, I think, non equidimensional. And so it's really important that we're taking this kind of the cohomology that we're taking is the cohomology of this um, of this DT sheaf as opposed to like the constant sheaf. So I want to say something really for, say something about the proof of this theorem. So again, the, the statement of the theorem is that. Um, for these kinds of curves, this correspondence is going to be true, independent of the singular, how bad the singularities are. And the, the reason why I want to say something about the proof is that actually the philosophy of the proof is actually something that sh shows up a lot in this kind of flavor of Donaldson-Thomas theory. And it's actually, it, it shows up in other kind of parts of algebraic geometry too. Um, so let me just say something about the philosophy of the proof. Maybe philosophy is too kind of pretentious a word. Let me just say strategy. Which is that you know you first kind of prove the theorem in some kind of very nice setting, some some kind of ideal setting, which in our case is going to be a situation where you know all this kind of virtual structure, this Baron function, this sheaf, etc., are all trivial. In our case, what we're going to do is we're going to prove the theorem. I'll tell you what that very nice setting is in a second. But the way we'll prove it in this setting is to really use some kind of properties of perverse sheaves. So this is going to use this kind of notion of what's called perverse continuation, which is a piece of lingo introduced by Lingo. And then we're going to kind of bootstrap from the very nice setting to the general case. And the idea here is we're here we're really just going to use some kind of nice functorial properties of vanishing cycles. And so here, you know, that what the kind of key idea is that you know, even if we have a very singular, very badly behaved moduli space, since we're writing it as sitting inside of, we can write it inside of a very nice moduli space as a critical locus. And that kind of will allow us to kind of transfer the nice results to the ugly situation using this kind of the fact that vanishing cycles is in fact a functor. So, okay, so I'll explain exactly now what I mean by this kind of two-step uh, strategy. But let me just mention that, you know, the, the strategy, this idea kind of shows up in other contexts. So, so other examples. This approach. Um, this idea kind of shows up, for instance, this is where, you know, I learned it from is in this kind of work of Davison and Meinhardt, 
where they were really working about quivers with potential. So this is in this very much in the setting of Reinecke's lectures. And they were able to prove theorems about the kind of Donaldson-Thomas theory of quivers with potential by reducing to the case of quivers without potential. And there, there was already some work of uh, Meinhardt and Reinecke. And then to go from step one to step two, then they, they just, you know, hit the theorems in, of, of Meinhardt and Reinecke with this kind of functor to produce the theorems in their setting. Another example we heard about, I mean, if you were at uh, Grochenig's talk earlier this week, uh, this kind of strategy shows up, it can be very useful when you study kind of Higgs bundles. And I'll, I'll maybe talk about that tomorrow a little bit if I have some time. So Grochenig used it, and this also showed up in some work I did uh, with uh, Juliang Shen, where we were kind of interested in some conjectures about Higgs bundles. And the idea was that, again, you find some nice setting where the theorem is kind of easy, and then you hit it with this kind of functor to kind of prove it in the case where the theorem is less easy. And then actually kind of in, a, in the non-comological setting, this kind of approach has been used, for instance, also in the drive category. So for instance, um, this work of uh, Halpern Leisner. He has some re results on like derived categories of moduli of K3s. And you know the kind of key structure result that lets him, um, you know, prove his result. He he applies this kind of approach where uh, instead of vanishing cycles, he's using this kind of notion of a singularity category or category of matrix factorization. But it's the same kind of principle where you have some kind of dream situation where everything's kind of easy, and then you kind of hit it with this construction to kind of prove things for more complicated derived categories. So let's see how to use this strategy in the case at hand. So again, remember the theorem that I want to kind of explain the proof of is this one here, uh, kind of irreducible one cycles on these local surfaces. And so what are the two steps? So again, the first step is to find a really nice situation where there's no kind of virtual structure going on where you can prove the theorem. And for us, what that will be is you can consider a, uh, a versal family of integral curves with locally planar singularities. So locally planar means that the the all of these the fibers of this map they're all can locally be embedded inside of a two. So the embedding dimension is always two for all the singular points of the curves in question. Versal means that um, if I pick a singular curve and I look at a take a singular point on it, the the you know universal deformation of that singularity uh, there's at least locally on B there's going to be a smooth map from a neighborhood of this point on B to this universal deformation of the singularity. So another way of saying that is that, you know, if I give you a singular fiber and I look at one of the singularities, all the kind of, you know, partial, all the kind of partial smoothings of it will also show up in the, in the nearby fibers of this family. In particular, so th this is nice in the sense that it's kind of, very far from our setting, the total space of this family is going to be smooth. And in fact, all the moduli spaces that we would want to associate to this family are also going to be smooth. So for instance, on the moduli space of one-dimensional sheaves, I have this kind of object here, which is just kind of, it's the family of, if you like, compactified Jacobian. So this, for if I fix a point on B and I look at the corresponding curve, I'm taking rank one, Torsion free sheaves on the fibers. The fibers of this might be singular, but the total space is smooth.
On the stable pair side, what I can do is I can take the relative Hilbert scheme of points. The value of very n. And again, the fibers of this might be singular because the fibers of my original family of curves are singular, but the total space is smooth. And again, that's something that's implied by this condition on the deformations of the singularities. And so the theorem in this case, which is actually a refinement of what we need, was something that was proven by uh, myself and Jiwei Yun, and then also um, Miglarini and Shende. And it basically says that on the left-hand side, I can take the um, <coughs> constant sheaf on this smooth thing and push it forward. So let's call this, you know, pi h is kind of the Hilbert scheme. And here I'll call this pi j because it's like the compact pi Jacobian. So you think of this as some you know, direct sum, you know, indexed by n of all these, you know, push forwards. That this is the same as taking on the right hand side. I'm going to just take the the single space. I'm going to take its perverse cohomology sheaves. That's by Q. Okay, so what does this mean on the right? What I really mean is that, you know, this thing's in the denominator, I can kind of expand out as a generating series. I can do both of them. And then, you know, for any given, you know, power of Q, there are only gonna be finitely many terms like this that show up. And so concretely it's saying that it's saying that the cohomology on the left hand side of one of these singular curves, and I take its Hilbert scheme of points, and I sum over n is basically determined on the right hand side by taking the kind of perverse filtration of the cohomology of the compact by Jacobian. And again, this thing had this, this theorem again has this kind of strange feature that on the left hand side, the number of points is indexed by Q on the right hand side, the kind of perverse degree is indexed by Q. This is the kind of thing that's kind of predicted from this kind of Gopakarvafa uh, stable pairs correspondence. And this is kind of the first case where one can kind of prove it. And it's really important that you're taking the perverse filtration here. That, that's kind of, that'll be kind of important in the proof. Can I ask a question about this formula? Yeah. So, is there a natural way to put a filtration on the vector spaces in the right hand side so that the associated graded is the left hand side times some some symmetric algebra? Uh, let's see. So I guess I'm wondering if one can categorify the statement in a certain sense. Oh, oh yes, yes, yes. Okay, right. So uh categorify it, let's see. So I this the statement that maybe uh is relevant here, and maybe maybe this is what you're asking. But uh, after you know these papers, uh, Jorgen uh, Renamo kind of wrote a paper where he, what he basically did was um, he constructed an algebra action of you know he basically constructed raising and lowering operators on on these spaces, uh, and then if you look at kind of the the you know the, the primitive elements with respect to that you know vial algebra action that basically picks out the cohomology of the compactified Jacobian, and so a statement like this is basically saying that you know these are the generators 
And then this denominator is coming by kind of freely acting on it with the kind of raising operators in your algebra. Is, is that kind of what you were asking about? Yeah, that's perfect. Thank you. All right. So this, you know, this is kind of a concrete theorem in the sense that you know these compactified Jacobians are for these you know nice planar curves with planar singularities are pretty explicit, and these Hilbert schemes are also pretty explicit. Um, and it, what's interesting about it, from my point of view, is that you know it forces you to really see these uh, perverse filtrations on this space of compactified Jacobians. So they kind of show up in a pretty from a pretty uh, natural starting point. You know, the left hand side is something you could really try to calculate, and it immediately lets you calculate the perverse filtration on the right-hand side. Even though the perverse filtration itself, to try to define it from first principles, is um, a little bit um, mysterious. So the proof, well, what is the idea of the proof? Um, so again, the kind of you know buzz phrase that I like to use is this idea of what's called perverse continuation. If I give you, let's say I have a, just any proper map from x to y where x is smooth, and I take the push forward of let's say the constant sheet. I can study it. I can study its perverse cohomology, and one of the, you know the first things, interesting things that happens in this situation is that we actually have something stronger than just looking at the uh, perverse cohomology sheaves. Uh, the perverse cohomology sheaves determine this complex in the sense that um, we have a, a decomposition theorem that tells me that this push forward is actually a direct sum. of the perverse cohomology sheaves shifted so that they live in the right degree. Now, each of these perverse sheaves, I could look at its kind of, you know, simple constituents. And then we say that S has Full support if each of these pieces are all supported on Y. And when I say support, I mean really kind of strictly supported. They're not pushed forward from something lower dimensional. This is kind of a strong condition on this. Um, on this map, so for instance, if I like take Y and I just blew it up at a point, that would not satisfy this property. But if you are in this situation, then the perverse cohomology sheets PK are in you know a precise sense determined by the restriction to some kind of you know to large open subsets of U which if you shrink U enough, you can assume as a local system or maybe a shifted local system. And determine in really some kind of algorithmic sense. This is what's called this notion of uh, IC extension. And so the way you can use that is that imagine you're in a situation where you have two Perverse sheaves, which are you know fully supported, which have full support in this sense, in the sense that they're determined algorithmically by their restriction to this open set. Then, if you have uh, let's say an isomorphism of this generic restriction, then you can promote it to an isomorphism over the entire base.
even though you don't know, I mean, when I said it's algorithmically determined, that's kind of a lie. It's not like you could like, well, I don't know. I think it would be hard to do it by hand and actually see what the fibers are over the complement of U. So even though, you know, the fiber of P and P prime over these kind of, you know, the boundary could be quite complicated, you still know kind of just on, on general grounds that they're the same. And so the way to prove this theorem in this kind of nice case is by one matching the kind of Hilbert scheme side and the kind of compactified Jacobian side over some large open set. And if the open set where the kind of curves are smooth, this family by assumption was versal. So on an open, uh, over an open subset, all the fibers will in fact be smooth. And then two, showing that both sides have full support. Because once I do that, once I show, once I've matched them on this open set, then kind of automatically by this principle, I match them over the entire base. So, um, so for two, how do you show something like this has full support? Well, this is hard. This requires a theorem. So this is actually essentially, this is something of the techniques for doing this were developed by Ngo and his work on the fundamental lemma. That's on the compactified Jacobian side, the Hilbert scheme side, you basically just can reduce to that case. And this is, you know, this is, I think is hard. It proves it by a passage to characteristic P and it's really some kind of property of the fact that generically these are kind of, you know, abelian vibrations. Some, it has something to do with the fact that these fibers generically look like uh, abelian varieties. What about the first part? Once you do that though, then you're reduced to a question about smooth curves. And this is essentially, this is basically just the cohomological version of McDonald's theorem again. Now these Hilbert schemes are just symmetric powers of a smooth curve. And then the, you know, part of what he did, he didn't really just prove a theorem about Euler characters, he proved this theorem much more generally, which is that you can kind of calculate the cohomology of the symmetric power of a smooth curve in terms of the cohomology of the compactified Jacobian. So this is the, like I said, so this is the kind of first step. This is the nice case, which is where your family of curves happens to be just extremely well behaved. All the moduli spaces are smooth. There's no sheaf of vanishing cycles anywhere here. And then what lets you do it is that even the the, the, fam, the total space is smooth, but the fibers are singular. But your situation is so nice that you also have this kind of continuation property where you can even just reduce it to studying a question about smooth curves. Then what about step two? So step two is where you kind of go to the general case. Now I have a curve sitting inside the total space KS. S is just some surface. It doesn't have to be Fano or anything like that. And the only kind of really assumption is that it's the projection of this. is still a kind of integral curve inside of S. And so then the claim 
is that we have the following diagram. And this diagram will allow us to reduce step two to step one. So uh, let's see, how do I wanna write this? So first I'm gonna write down T mapping to A1. Oh, let's see. So there exists, um, so first of all, there exists a versal family. of deformations of C. C again is this locally planar curve, which is the image of gamma, such that, okay, so, and a function on the base. So T maps to A1, with some function G. And then I can look at the picture from step one. I have to look at this family of compactified Jacobians, and I can look at this family of relative Hilbert schemes. This is what I call pi H. I, J before. And I could take these compositions, which I'll call, you know, F to the N and F, J. Such that if I look at the pair space on X, PT space, uh, this is the critical locus. of this composition. And M beta X is the critical locus of FJ. Maybe early, uh, maybe the precise statement is that the pair space kind of in a neighborhood, you know, in a, in a neighborhood of um, the uh, fiber of this in the Chow variety. In other words, I can kind of ex construct critical charts that are built out of the kind of nice situation in step one. And so the, the, the picture you end up with is that here's kind of M beta of X, the Chow variety of X, at least after I maybe shrink it, it sits inside here. And then similarly for the kind of pairs space. Now constructing this diagram takes a certain amount of uh, effort, and this is kind of you know what we did in our paper. But once you have it, uh, then you're in good shape. You see, we know two things about this vanishing cycles construction, which is that uh, when I take vanishing cycles of, of a function, it commutes with proper push forward. And second, it preserves, because it's a, a sense perverse sheaves to perverse sheaves, it preserves um, taking perverse cohomology. And so what I can do is I'm interested in, for instance, taking uh, uh, the constant sheaf here and taking its vanishing cycles and then pushing it forward, let's say to the chow variety or maybe all the way to T. But instead of being, doing it that way, I can first push forward to T and then take vanishing cycles with respect to this function G. So for instance, on the stable pair side, on the, on the, on the one dimensional sheaf side, I'm interested in maybe this object. What did I call it? and then maybe pushing this forward. But this is the same as taking phi sub G of and then similarly for this relative Hilbert scheme of points. And so then to prove the main theorem, you just 
take the main result of the first step which is some equality of sheaves on T and then hit it with this functor phi sub G. And so here it's important in particular that, you know, phi sub G isn't just a sheaf, it's, a, it's an operation that you can stick in any kind of complex of sheaves and produce another one. That's kind of what we're using here. I have some isomorphism on T, I apply it with this functor and I'll get an isomorphism on whatever its support is. Um, all right, um, I'm almost out of time. I was going to do try to do an example. So, you know, in, in this generality, you know, you kind of is kind of a, an abstract argument, but you can actually use this to do some calculations. So, um, this principle. Uh, so, let me write down the example because it's, it's kind of fun to just to see how this all works out explicitly, um, which is that uh, you could take a curve in a surface where C is like some rational genus one curve. So maybe it has a node or maybe it's a cusp. And then you can kind of rig the surface so that the normal bundle is you know, degree zero, but non-trivial. What that means is that this curve is rigid on the surface. So chow beta of S is just a point. But if I now take the total space of the canonical bundle, uh, the Chow variety, the, the, the curve can deform off the surface. Um, so the picture you get in the nodal case is like this, and then it can deform off the surface in a one dimensional family. And the moduli space of one-dimensional sheaves in this case uh, looks like the kind of thing that we got in that Enriquez example. You have when the curve is on the surface itself, then you have a genus one curve. And so the compactified Jacobian in that case is just a copy of that curve itself. When the curve moves off the surface and drops in genus from one to zero, then you just get a single point. Forever. So you get something that looks like this. And again, the singularity type here looks like the critical locus of X, Y, Z. And the map to the Chow variety is I just kind of contract this nodal curve to a point and I get a map to this to line. And so now you can actually use the procedure to actually compute um, The, Gopu, the kind of the Gopu Kumar Vafa invariance in this case. But in fact, again, this procedure works much more generally. So, th so the case I was kind of highlighting was really, and computationally, you know, I've just been doing nodal and cuspidal examples. But the strategy really works much more generally. So, you, you know, the situation that I like, for instance, is you could do something where on the surface I have like, you know, just a bunch of branches coming together, but then in the total space of the threefold, they can still come together, but now maybe you get a embedding dimension three. So you get something that's really far from um, Gorenstein. Then it's a little harder to do this calculation explicitly, I think, but I think you could still do it if you want. Um, all right, since I'm out of time, uh, let me stop here. So what I'll do tomorrow then is I'll talk about the evidence we have. This everything here was about an irreducible one cycle. And so you can ask, well, what do we know when you allow multiplicities and reducibility and so on like that? So I'll talk about that. And then I'll kind of talk about some kind of other directions that you can try to investigate. All right, uh, let me stop here. Thank you. This picture where you can, can realize both the Hilbert scheme and the moduli space as ascritic callosi in what generality on gamma and C can you state this? Oh uh, yeah, right. So actually we right now, you know, in our paper we just did it for um 
in our paper, we just did it for the integral case. I think it's probably fine, but we, we didn't actually do this. I mean, I, in fact, in general, I think this whole strategy, let's say the curve was reduced, reducible, but still reduced. Uh, then their analog of step one is already in the books. And I think there would be some analog of step two as well, but we never worked it out very carefully. Um, so that's something that I think is doable. Once the curve downstairs has multiplicities, then I think it becomes harder. And then I'm not actually sure e both steps one and step two are still kind of mysterious. So for instance, forget about the surface for a second. I mean, forget about the threefold for a second, just in the case, in the locally planar case, if my curve is non-reduced, uh, then we would expect this theorem to be modified in some way. Uh, even in the reducible case, this theorem has to get modified. And then, then that would kind of filter down and kind of this diagram in step two would I think also become more complicated. But I, I don't think there is any, I, I think it's, it's not crazy to imagine that this for in the local surface case, some version of this diagram might still work. But I, you're gonna, it, would, it would require more argument. Even in the reducible case, we never wrote it down carefully. And if you ask the kind of question for a curve in a threefold instead of a curve in a in a local surface, yeah, then I don't know. Yes, that's right. Yeah, for, in the general case, really for a general threefold, then I then it's harder to see what's going to happen. Um, then you run into these questions about like, so you know what basically what's going on here is that we you know we have this notion of a critical chart. Can you find a a, a description of the critical locus that is you know you have an, you have a cover of your moduli space by these things that are you know, critical loci of functions. And what's going on in this step is that we found a critical chart that's big enough that it contains the entire fiber of the map to the Chow variety. And so the question is whether you can do that in general. Like if I give you just like a random curve and I, you know, possibly with some multiplicities and I give you all the sheaves that have that support, is there a big enough critical chart that will contain all of those sheaves at the same time? If there is, then I think then I think some version of this argument would kind of you could then try to start using it. But these theorems that show the existence of the critical charts don't really give you a sense of how big those charts are. You know, there's a risky open, but do they contain this entire fiber? And that's kind of really what's kind of going on in this step too. That's very special, and I honestly don't know the answer to that in general. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, you show that this moduli space of sheaves on on X is a critical locus. Is it, is it, how do you compare that to the other critical locus description as like uh, this, that it's just a moduli space of sheaves on a threefold? Like, is there some comparison? Is it the same? Oh yeah, 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 that's right. Yeah, so this critical structure agrees with the one that you get like on just general abstract grounds. Yeah, that's right. And that's important. You actually have to, you have to make some argument for that. Uh, Cause you know, we're using a very specific one here and you need to match it up. Um, and ultimately it comes down to, you know, it uh, comes down to, for instance, you need to use the fact that, uh, you know, there's this very specific Calabi out three form on the total space of chaos. And that has to be the one that you use in that abstract general nonsense approach too. So at some point you need the fact that you pick the correct Calabi out three form and that lets you show that you can match the, um, the, the, the critical structures as well. Any other questions? Let's check the chat. No, since I'm, this is it, let's thank the fish again.